1962. The average home cost about $12,500. By comparison, one of the cheapest new cars you can get today as of this recording is the 2017 Nissan Versa S, which starts at $12,855. In 1962, you could get a new car for about $3,125, just a little bit more than a brand new MacBook Pro today. Of course, $1 in 1962 wasn't the same as a dollar today. In 1962, one dollar would have been roughly about the same or have the same buying power as about eight dollars today. For Hollywood, 1962 brought a burst of movies that we now consider to be classic films. The Longest Day, The Music Man, and To Kill a Mockingbird were all released in 1962. But none of those films won Best Picture at the Academy Awards. That honor went to yet another classic film. Lawrence of Arabia was made for about $15 million, the equivalent of $121 million today. No small sum, to be sure, but that wouldn't even land it on the top 50 most expensive films today. By comparison, the most recent Ben-Hur movie cost about $140 million to make in 2016. Of course, 2016's Ben-Hur was nothing like the original as it would go on to lose an estimated $120 million of those dollars after an abysmal box office performance. Lawrence of Arabia, on the other hand, was a smash hit as it raked in over $70 million worldwide. Unlike most modern movies, Lawrence of Arabia opens with the epic theme from composer Maurice Jarre set on top of a black screen for the first few minutes. That score would be one of seven Oscars the film would win at the 1963 Academy Awards. And that's out of an amazing 10 nominations. It's a film that has single-handedly become a Hollywood classic while also having a major impact on how the Western world sees the Middle East. In fact, many people have a hard time telling a difference between the true story and the one portrayed on the screen. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. It's time for two truths and a lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'll share three things. Two of them are true. One of them is a lie. Listen closely for the answers scattered throughout the episode. Sometimes they're easy to find and sometimes they're not so easy. But at the end of the episode, we'll learn which one was a lie. Okay, here they are. Number one, Lawrence was not the first name of Lawrence of Arabia. Number two, the real Lawrence was the only liaison from the British and French to the Arab revolt. Number three, Lawrence was not publicly known until after World War I ended. As you're listening to today's story, if you hear something and wonder how it's spelled, or even if you just want to grab a written copy of this episode to share with a friend, you can get that at the show's home on the web at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. They're on a pay-what-you-want model, so you can pay a dollar, two dollars, a thousand dollars, a million dollars, or you can just grab it for free if you can't afford it but you still want that written version. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's epic film, Lawrence of Arabia. The movie begins at the end. Peter O'Toole's character, T.E. Lawrence, is riding his motorcycle through country roads when he nearly has a head-on collision and is killed. At his funeral, a reporter, played by Jack Headley, tries to learn more about his life. There's no time indicated in the movie, and while the details were made up for the film, T.E. Lawrence was a real person who died after being injured in a motorcycle accident in Dorset, England in 1935. After this, in the movie, we're taken back to Lawrence's time in the British Army. But before we join back up with the movie's timeline, let's take a brief moment to learn a few things about Lawrence that the movie does not mention. First, his name. While everyone may have called him Lawrence, that was his last name. His full name was Thomas Edward Lawrence, or T.E. Lawrence, as Peter O'Toole's character is officially billed in the movie. The real Lawrence was born on August 16th, 1888, near the town of Tremadog in Wales. 
That's about 200 miles or 320 kilometers to the northwest of London in the United Kingdom. For about four years, from 1910 to 1914, Lawrence was introduced to the Middle East as he worked as an archaeologist at the ancient city of Karmakish. If you're not familiar with that name, Karmakish was an ancient city where the Bible mentions a battle taking place between the Babylonians and the Egyptians in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 46, verse 2. Most historians believe that battle took place around 605 BC, but the location of the city wasn't known until it was discovered by an archaeologist named George Smith in 1876. Today, it's located in the country of Syria to the north of Damascus. Things would change for Lawrence, though, as it did for many others in the year 1914. That's when, on July 28th, the Great War officially began. Soon after, Lawrence joined the British Army and was quickly stationed in Egypt. We don't have the official documentation to prove why he was stationed there, but most historians have speculated that with the onset of World War I, the British Army was moving a lot of troops around the world, including the Middle East region. Since Lawrence already had knowledge of the area, having spent the last few years as an archaeologist there, it would make sense for the British Army to leverage that and to keep him in the area. Back in the movie, there's no dates displayed on screen, but after the introduction at the funeral, we're sent back in time to when Lawrence was in Egypt. The real Lawrence's role was as an intelligence officer, so the movie is fairly accurate when it shows Peter O'Toole's version of Lawrence working in a room painting a map. According to the movie, his first assignment is to find Prince Faisal. As he does, the movie takes its sweet time showing us the long distances Peter O'Toole's version of Lawrence had to take to get there. Maybe that's why the movie is almost four hours long. Anyway, the length of the journey to travel across the desert sands might actually be one of the most historically accurate parts of the film. It does take a long time to travel across the desert. On the trip, Lawrence's guide, a man by the name of Tafis, is killed when he drinks from a well he's not supposed to. Well, it's not drinking that kills him. That was Sheriff Ali, who kills Tafis after shooting him for drinking from the well. In the movie, Tafis is played by Zia Moyedin. Again, in the movie, once Sheriff Ali and Lawrence meet, Ali offers to take Lawrence and meet Faisal. Historically, the framework was correct, but the details here were all made up for the movie. Let's start with the character of Sheriff Ali, who's played by Omar Sharif in the film. Oh, and in case you're wondering, uh, Sheriff is a title, meaning the bearer is highborn or of noble blood. The character of Sheriff Ali is not a real person. Instead, he's an amalgamation of multiple people that Lawrence mentioned in his book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, one of whom was named Sheriff Ali. However, the real Sheriff Ali didn't do most of the things that we see the character of Sheriff Ali doing in the movie. It would seem the filmmakers took the name from one of the people in the book and then tied that character to many of the actions from other people in the book. For example, the real Sheriff Ali found a guide for Lawrence on his quest to meet Faisal. That guide? A tribesman by the name of Tafis el-Rashid and his son, Abdullah. So as you can guess, the real Sheriff Ali wouldn't have killed Tafis, the guy that he himself set Lawrence up with. As Lawrence mentioned in his book, the desert had laws of its own that most people not familiar with its ways would not understand. The land itself was owned, Each rock or patch of sand would have someone who laid claim to it. However, natural elements were allowed to be used by all. Things like drinking water from a well. As long as it was for personal use and not profitable gain, no matter whose land it was. Many of the things we see Sheriff Ali do on screen were things that Lawrence did with a man named Sheriff Nasir. Someone that Lawrence met after he was at Faisal's camp. So the movie changed quite a bit, and the changes don't stop there. Another apparent liberty the filmmakers took was to imply that Lawrence was the sole British liaison to the Arab leaders. While the movie correctly showed Lawrence spent his fair share of time alone with the Arab leaders in an attempt to work with them, in truth, there were others from the British army there as well. Men like Colonel Cyril Wilson, 
Colonel Pierce C. Joyce, and Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Francis Newcomb, just to name a few. These three in particular were Lawrence's superiors, though, and some of them, like Newcomb, often accompanied the expeditions Lawrence took part in. There were a number of British and French soldiers who helped as well, many of whom had been helping with the Arab Revolt before Lawrence was assigned to help. He came on October 23rd, 1916. In the movie, when Lawrence meets Faisal, who's played by legendary actor Alec Guinness, Faisal is intrigued by the young British officer. The casting of Alec Guinness to play an Arab noble is an interesting bit here, but perhaps that's typical for Hollywood. No, Alec Guinness isn't Middle Eastern. He's English. You might remember him as the original Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. Oh, and while the movie doesn't really mention this, the Ottoman Empire was on the Axis side of the war along with the Germans. That's World War I. That's why they were the enemies of the British Empire on the Allied side of the war. The Ottoman Empire is not around anymore. It was ended with World War I. But today, the Ottoman Empire was out of modern-day Turkey, so that's why they're referred to as the Turks in the movie. Anyway, even though the movie doesn't have dates, based on history, the events that we see on screen with Faisal and Lawrence chatting probably happened early in 1917. We don't know exactly how the conversations went. What we see in the movie is not likely how it went down, but the end result was similar. It was here that Lawrence met the real Faisal, or his full name being Faisal I bin Hussein bin Ali al-Hashimi. He was about the same age as Lawrence, being born on May 20th, 1885, about three years before Lawrence was. As his name implies, Faisal was the son of Hussein bin Ali, who, in turn, was the Grand Sheriff of Mecca. In the movie, the British want to help Faisal's attempt to revolt against the Turks. Anthony Quayle's character, Colonel Brighton, is in the tent with Faisal and Lawrence. It's Brighton who recommends to Faisal that they retreat to the city of Yenbo. Quite the contrarian, Lawrence suggests he can strike back at the Turks and take Aqaba so the British can use the port there to offload supplies. The catch here is that the small town of Aqaba has massive guns pointing toward the bay, expecting an assault coming from the water. But there's little defense behind the town because there's a massive desert. Nature is the defense from a land attack. The details and conversations were, of course, fictionalized for the film, but the overall plot here is pretty accurate. By that I mean that Faisal did take a shining of sorts to Lawrence. Maybe it was Lawrence's charming personality. More likely, though, it was Lawrence's history in the area that gave him extensive knowledge of the region, much more than many of the other British and French officers. Back in the movie, during the meeting with Alec Guinness's version of Faisal, Lawrence brashly opposes Anthony Quayle's version of British Colonel Brighton. Like many other characters in the movie, Colonel Brighton was made up for the film as an amalgamation of many of the British officers serving with Lawrence. If there's someone close to the colonel's character, it would probably be Lieutenant Colonel Newcomb. I'm mostly saying that because, well, in the original script for Lawrence of Arabia, the character that would become Colonel Brighton was actually named Colonel Newcomb. However, even then, unlike the character we see in the movie, the real Newcomb was a good friend of Lawrence who, like Lawrence, was able to gain friendship from the Arab leaders. Anyway, back in the movie, it's Lawrence who suggests Faisal take Aqaba. The implication in the movie is that the British will be able to provide much-needed supplies through Aqaba to help with the revolt. Geographically, Aqaba is in modern-day Jordan and serves as the only port city in the modern-day country of Jordan. It's near the aptly named Aqaba Gulf, and that's on the north side of the Red Sea. So, it's certainly plausible, but historically, the scenes that we see in the movie here are not correct. It wasn't Lawrence's idea solely. Instead, it was a collective idea from the British officers there along with the Arab leaders who were working together to try to unseat the Turkish hold on the region. For the British, this was part of World War I, weakening the Axis powers of which the Ottoman Empire was a part. 
For the Arabs, it was about being free from the Turks who had grown from servants in the region of Western Asia during medieval times to ruling their own country and controlling most of the region. To give some historical context of the strife between the Arabs and the Turks, in 1909, Sultan Abdul Hamid II lost power after the Young Turk Revolution began the previous year. He was the 34th and last of the sultans of the Ottoman Empire and the last to effectively rule with autocracy. After his fall, a political party calling themselves the Young Turks took over. According to Lawrence, one of the primary cries for the Young Turk movement was that, quote, Turkey made Turkish for the Turks, end quote, or basically kick anyone who's not Turkish out of Turkey. This mentality would eventually lead to the Armenian Genocide, but that's a story for another day. Another people who suffered, thankfully not to the extent of the Armenians, were the Arabs. One of the primary downsides to Turkey, according to the Turks in power at the time, was that there were Arabs there, so they tried to force them out. This struggle was the seed for the Arab revolt. Thanks to soldiers from France and Britain, like Lawrence, who did indeed earn the name Lawrence of Arabia, collections of Arab tribes were able to learn from the British and French military tactics. It was a common interest for the British and French to help the Arabs in their revolt. As the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In the movie, it's on their way to Aqaba when Sheriff Ali gains respect for Lawrence. This happens when one of the men in the caravan falls off his camel at some point during the night. They don't notice it until the next day when they see his empty camel, but Lawrence goes back to rescue the man. The character's name was Gassim, and he's played by I.S. Johar in the film. This event happened, but it was quite different in reality than the movie shows. In truth, according to Lawrence's recollection, at some point during the night, Gassim had to relieve himself, so he got off of his camel to do so. After he did, he lost the rest of the caravan. That gives you an idea of just how dark it is at night in the desert. As best as Lawrence could estimate, Gassim probably passed out too, most likely from heat exhaustion due to their travels over the previous few days. When Gassim awoke, he was alone. Lawrence did go back to rescue Gassim, but he did so rather begrudgingly, mostly because he felt responsible for Gassim. It wasn't until after this that Lawrence was scolded for risking his own life and the lives of those who went with him by the Arab leaders in the caravan, Nasir and Aouda Abu Tai. We haven't really mentioned Aouda, but he was a real person. In the movie, the character of Aouda Abu Tai is portrayed by Anthony Quinn. In reality, Aouda was noble and a highly respected leader in the region. While historically Lawrence earned fame, Aouda was a man who many consider to have been predominantly responsible for the success of the Arab revolt. Oh, and the scene in the movie that we see where, after the rescue of Gassim where Omar Sharif's version of Sheriff Ali burns Lawrence's clothes to give him Arab garments is completely fictional. No one burned Lawrence's British Army uniform. It was Faisal who offered the traditional Arab robes to Lawrence before they ever embarked on their trip to take Aqaba. Faisal suggested it to help the people in his camp take to Lawrence quicker. He wouldn't stand out quite as much. Lawrence quickly agreed to wearing the robes because, as Lawrence put it, a British uniform isn't very comfortable to wear while riding a camel. Oh, and while we're talking about standing out, a quick little side note here would be about Lawrence's physical appearance. In the movie, Peter O'Toole is a tall, blonde hair and blue-eyed man who is quite the Hollywood leading man, very fair looking. In truth, Lawrence did actually look a little bit like Peter O'Toole in the movie. The real Lawrence did have blonde hair and blue eyes, but Peter O'Toole, the actor, was about 6'2", and the real Lawrence was only about 5'5", five five, so... He may have stood out, but not quite as much as Peter O'Toole did. Anyway, back in the movie, the attack on Aqaba is a smashing success. After this, the movie's first half comes to a close as it's time for the intermission. Yes, many movies back in the day used to have intermissions. What we see on screen was made up for the movie, of course, but the overall gist is true. Aqaba was an important target for the Arab Revolt, something that the movie also implies – 
However, the movie makes it seem like the attack was pretty much Lawrence, Sheriff Ali, Aouda, and a few other men. In truth, Faisal was there. He was there for much of the revolt. And while the Arab force weren't the British or French armies, they were supplied by both the British and the French. So they had guns, uniforms, mules, camels, and plenty of other supplies that they used. If there's one part that the movie does get correct, it's that Lawrence and the other Arab leaders did attack the coastal fort of Aqaba in the spring of 1917 after riding miles and miles across the desert. While the British and French may have been supplying the revolt, this particular strategy was something Lawrence later would admit to keeping a secret from his superiors at the British Army. The part of the movie where Lawrence leaves shortly after the attack at Aqaba is true. The real Lawrence left Aqaba after this victory to go to Cairo. It was here, as the movie implies, that Lawrence told his commanding officer, a man named General Allenby of the victory. Oh, and in the movie, General Allenby is played by Jack Hawkins. So while we don't really know exactly what the scenario was like after the capture of Aqaba, since Lawrence hadn't told General Allenby or any of his other commanding officers of the raid, it came as quite a surprise to hear that the Arab revolt had taken a major stronghold from the Turks. In the movie, there's a moment where Peter O'Toole's version of Lawrence is captured by the Turks. The officer in charge makes a mention of Lawrence's fine skin in a moment that gets a little awkward. The movie is not accurate in how it's depicted, but the implication is sadly spot on. It happened on November 20th, 1917, and Lawrence was in the city of Dara on the southern tip of modern-day Syria. Lawrence was in disguise, similar to what the movie shows, when he was captured by the local bey, the title for a Turkish chieftain. While in captivity, Lawrence was beaten quite heavily, and sexually abused multiple times by the Bey and his guardsmen. This was an experience that most historians believe had a major psychological impact on Lawrence, and understandably so. According to Lawrence himself, quote, I lost all my innocence that night in Dara, end quote. It's likely the Turks didn't fully realize who Lawrence was because after the physical and mental torture, he was eventually released. Back in the movie, there's a scene where Lawrence is shocked to hear about the sykes picot Agreement. It's the politician, Mr. Dryden, who's played by Claude Rains, who mentions the agreement to Lawrence. Shaken, Lawrence starts to realize the British and French aren't going to let the Arabs have their land once they're free of the Turks. That's not really true. The sykes picot Agreement was real, but in truth, Lawrence knew about it all along. In fact, there were moments where Lawrence recalled how bad he felt knowing that he was helping the Arab revolt and it was highly unlikely the British would let the Arabs keep the land that they were winning. He had to have felt that he was betraying his new friends, Nasir and Aouda in particular. After all, he kind of was. As the movie continues, the next big target in the Arab revolt is Damascus. As they get closer, we see Peter O'Toole's version of Lawrence start to crack. These scenes are all fictional for the film, but as we learned earlier, the real Lawrence was psychologically impacted by the abuse he suffered while held captive, so it's very plausible that he could have begun to crack like the movie shows. What is true is that the Arab revolt was able to take Damascus. As with all of the military conquests so far, it wasn't because of Lawrence alone. It was mostly because of Aouda, Nasir, and the other Arab leaders. I don't mean to imply Lawrence didn't play an important part, but the movie certainly played it up quite a bit while simultaneously downplaying just how much impact the Arab leaders themselves and their soldiers had. However, the result was the same. At about 9 o'clock a.m. on October 1st, 1918, Lawrence entered Damascus. Oh, and as an example of the things that the movie changed, by the time General Allenby arrives, Lawrence is already there in the movie. As viewers, we get the sense that Lawrence was there first. That's not true. Lawrence arrived after Major Henry Alden of the 10th Australian Light Horse Brigade. We haven't even talked about the Australians there, but that gives you an idea of how this was really an allied assistance to the Arab Revolt and not something that Lawrence was doing on his own. It was Major Alden who formally accepted the surrender of the Turkish governor, Amir Said, at Damascus. <laughs> 
the details are all made up. But the movie does correctly show that Lawrence helped set up the Arab government in Damascus. Although we already knew that he learned about the sykes picot agreement before, he started to grow increasingly displeased with it. On October 30th, 1918, the Armistice of Mudros was signed on board a British ship just off the Mudros Harbor near the island of Lemnos, that's near Greece. The Armistice put an immediate end to the conflicts between the Ottoman Empire and the Allied forces in World War I. It didn't end the war altogether, just the fighting between the Ottoman Empire and the Allied forces. Less than a month later, on November 11th, 1918, World War I officially came to an end. While the Great War had a lot of implications for the sake of our story, this was officially the beginning of the end for the Ottoman Empire, which would dissolve on November 1st, 1922, when the Sultanate was officially abolished. Then, on October 29th, 1923, the country of Turkey was established in the place of the Ottoman Empire. And finally, on March 3rd, 1924, the Caliphate of the Ottoman Empire, the last remaining piece of the empire that was established in the year 1299, was abolished. For Lawrence, his fame started to spread after the Great War. The reporter we saw in the movie was based on something that did happen, the real reporter's name was Lowell Thomas, and for a small time, Lawrence let him follow along as they raided Turkish positions. With the war ending, from this footage that Thomas gathered, he put together a film that masses around the world couldn't get enough of. It was a massive hit, and as the year 1919 rolled around, Thomas returned to the United States where he began a speaking tour displaying collections of photos and footage. It was a tour that would spread to London. It was because of this tour that people started to learn the name of T.E. Lawrence, or how he began to be known, Lawrence of Arabia. The events in the movie may be over, but let's continue for a moment to learn more about Lawrence after the war. It's an interesting history because, like many soldiers, Lawrence had a hard time adjusting to home life after the war. In 1919, Lawrence started using the vigorous notes that he'd taken during his excursions in the war. These formed the first draft of what would eventually become his book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Sadly, Lawrence lost that first draft in his bag when he switched trains at the Reading Railway Station on the outskirts of Greater London. Even more unfortunate, Lawrence had destroyed his original notes after writing that first draft. Certainly a major setback, but the next year, Lawrence rewrote the book from scratch. Then it went through a massive amount of edits and essentially was rewritten for a third time. Lawrence would later say that the book would be over 250,000 words long if he had not lost his first draft. The second draft, though, was even longer at 400,000 words. To give some context, Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace is widely considered to be one of the longest books ever published, and it comes in at about 580,000 words. Of course, that's Lawrence's word count before editing, but still, no wonder why the movie was so long. After completing his book, Lawrence searched for what to do with his life. He decided to go back to the military. But his fame was starting to grow, and he'd already served, so he enlisted in the Royal Air Force under the name John Hume Ross in August of 1922. He was found out and rejected because the recruiting officer didn't believe John Ross was his real name. He didn't know that this was Lawrence of Arabia, but the recruiting officer didn't want to recruit people falsifying their identity. Ever the stubborn Englishman, Lawrence managed to get a written order for the recruiting officer to accept Lawrence's enlisting. That worked for about six months until, in February of 1923, his superiors in the RAF found out who he really was. We don't really know how they found out, but once they did, they forced him out of the RAF. Still stubborn, he then enlisted in the British Army's Tank Corps as T.E. Shaw, or Thomas Edward Shaw. This actually worked for a couple years, but Lawrence didn't like it in the Tank Corps, so he petitioned to be transferred back to the RAF. They finally readmitted him, in August of 1925. 
This time, we have to assume his superiors in the RAF knew who T.E. Shaw really was, because in 1926, he published a book called Revolt in the Desert. It was a hit, and the increased publicity forced the RAF to assign Lawrence to a rather remote base in British India. He stayed there until 1928. We don't have many details about what happened there, but what we do know is that some RAF soldiers caught whiff of Lawrence potentially being a spy. There's never been any conclusive proof of this, but it was enough to force Lawrence's superiors to order him home to Great Britain. For the next seven years, a mentally tormented Lawrence finally started to find some peace. He remarked to many of his friends that he enjoyed his role in the RAF, where he was earning a reputation as a high-speed boat expert. He loved the adrenaline rush. His enlistment ended in March of 1935, and once again, Lawrence was faced with what he was supposed to do with the rest of his life. In May of the same year, as he was still pondering what his next role in life would be, Lawrence was taking a joyride on one of his numerous motorcycles. This time, it was a Bro Superior SS100, that's Bro, B-R-O-U-G-H, when it was a bike that many considered to be one of the best motorcycles that money could buy at the time. They cost the equivalent of about 11000 in today's U.S. dollars. We see this event at the very beginning of the film, and we've already talked about it briefly at the beginning of this episode, so we already know what happens. The movie is pretty accurate in its depiction. As Lawrence was riding along the countryside near Wareham in Dorset, there was a slight drop in the road that made it hard to see oncoming traffic. By the time he saw the two boys on their bicycles, it was too late. Lawrence jerked the motorcycle, narrowly missing the boys, but not their bicycles. His motorcycle clipped one of the bikes. Lawrence lost control and was thrown over the handlebars, causing substantial head wounds. Thomas Edward Lawrence died six days later from those injuries on May 19, 1935, at the age of 46. If you're wondering, no, he was not wearing a helmet. But while he was in the hospital for six days, one of the men who treated him was Dr. Hugh Cairns. Seeing Lawrence's injuries and subsequent death, Dr. Cairns was motivated to do something about unnecessary deaths like Lawrence's. Dr. Hugh Cairns would go on to dedicate most of the rest of his own life in studying motorcycle injuries it was this work that would lead to the modern day use of helmets both by the military and by private citizens. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. It might be hard to believe, with Lawrence of Arabia being almost four hours long, but there's so much that the movie didn't cover. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd be doing yourself a favor by reading Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence. You'll get a completely different look at the man himself, but just as importantly, you'll get a fresh look at the entire situation leading up to and during the Arab Revolt. The book Seven Pillars of Wisdom is in the public domain now, so there are sites where you can find it for free. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But if you like to listen to podcasts, you probably like audiobooks as well. And I found a great edition read by Roy McMillan over on Audible. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the two truths and a lie game, I wanted to share another five-star review from iTunes. This one comes from username France22975 and is the complete opposite of Lawrence of Arabia. It's short and sweet. Quote, really interesting and useful podcast, end quote. Thanks so much for taking the time to leave the kind words, France22975. I really appreciate it. And thank you, dear listener, for taking the time to find and listen to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you want to leave a five-star review for me to read in a future episode, hop on over to iTunes. It doesn't have to be something long and drawn out. It can be short and sweet, like France 22975's review. Finally, it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, 
Lawrence was not the first name of Lawrence of Arabia. Number two, the real Lawrence was the only liaison from the British and French to the Arab Revolt. Number three, Lawrence was not publicly known until after World War I ended. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number two. The movie makes it seem like Lawrence was the only British officer in the midst of Arabs during their revolt, but that's simply not true. As we learned, there were many other liaisons from both the British and French, one of the most predominant of these being Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Francis Newcomb. What did you think about Lawrence of Arabia? Even though the movie was scattered with inaccuracies, I don't think anyone can deny that it was a cinematic masterpiece that inspired a generation of filmmakers. Even today, we can still enjoy it for what it is, a movie, just as long as it stays as entertainment and we understand that it's not very historically accurate. The next time you're on social media, shoot me a message to let me know what you think of the movie, or if you read it, the book, or if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, the story we learned about in today's episode. You can find me hanging out in the Based on a True Story podcast Facebook group, or you can tweet at me where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Or maybe you're not a fan of social media. You can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. Mm-hmm.